just to present myself in a, a nutshell again, I'm a conceptual artist and I work cross-disciplinary. I think that's important to mention. Uh, elements of my practice are architectural case studies, drawings, and on-site and mainly participatory projects. Each of these elements uh, depend on the other, so they relate to one another. Um, so here on the top, uh, you see Caracas Growing Houses. It's an architectural case study. And you are looking at the installation at Hamburger Bahnhof, Museum of Contemporary Art in Berlin. Exhibition focused on the collection. Uh, it was titled Hello World, uh, year 2018, so two years ago. Um, Caracas Growing Houses is in collection of National Gallery in Berlin. And what you are looking at is a, a reconstruction of the work from 2012, they, when they actually bought the piece. Uh, it's, uh, but when they bought the work, uh, when they bought this architecture case study, uh, they did not buy the object. The museum bought a certificate of authenticity. So I thought maybe that's uh, interesting for you, the way how I deal with art objects. Um, so uh, I to the certificate of authenticity, which is a document, I added a manual, which includes explanation of the project and instructions how to construct the work in a, in a different setting in a new way. Um, Museum does not store construction materials, therefore reconstructions are always different one from another. On the very left, uh, you see the black and white photo, uh, which is a source image, a photo I took in the Caracas informal city when I worked there on a research project. And uh, this source image tells you that the architectural case study is an attempt to reconstruct a real life situation. In this case, two houses in informal city of Caracas. Uh, again, uh, also the way how I deal with uh, sculpture, because in a way this is a typical sculpture piece. Architectural case studies are portraits of cities. They are positioned in a gallery space, asymmetrical figures. Uh, they address visitors with their body and with their physicality. Uh, below you see objects on a shelf. Uh, this work is titled uh, pow Power Tools for Rural Explorers. And uh, they were actually exhibited at Galerie Nordenhake in Stockholm in 2016. Uh, none of the objects uh, was made or produced by me. Uh, so I, I exhibit those objects as context of contemporary culture. So you see a fiber basket from Katrina tribe from Amazonia, a ceramic water filter and so on. Um, I thought that uh, at this point I can explain my relationship with art objects because you see I treat them in a different way than the usual art world. Uh, the, the equation you see here, subject equals object does not work for me. Uh, here, uh, the, the eye mirrors the object. Uh, the object is self-referential object, uh, which was represented in uh, object sculpture in minimal art and so on. And the eye means I am the author and focus here is on individualism and authorship. Uh, this is the word, this is the uh, equation I encountered when in 1990s, I moved from Slovenia to the USA, uh, where I stayed a couple of years. And I have a little anecdote for you. When I would show slides of my work, uh, my artwork, uh, and I would explain uh, the work and the process. I would say, we think we make, and always someone from the audience would ask, who is we? I did talk about myself, uh, but it in, in the spirit of enlarged subjectivity, enlarged subjectivity, uh, which was very hard to explain at this time in the USA. 
and uh, which, by the way, uh, many want to embrace today, this enlarged subjectivity. Uh, today, the equation uh, would be better a uh, place like this, maybe subject equals the world or the, the earth. So we see a totally different relationship between I and what we are looking at. Um, the object, uh, I'll talk about more about uh, what happened to this object. The self-referential object actually is transformed today in my work in relational object. Uh, and the value of relational object is in its instability and ability to relate. Uh, so a relational object exists as a relational device, a tool I can use. And more of that later, I, I'm sorry if it's a little bit of theory here, but I think that's very important that we don't deal with object anymore, but we deal with uh, relational object. Of course, when we are uh, working on participatory or collaborative projects. So uh, another uh, part of my work are drawings. Uh, here you see a photo of uh, selected works at the Venice Biennial in 2009. Uh, I, in more or less, I, I work in two formats. Uh, smaller drawings are called drawing narratives, and they re read like uh, picture books. Where they, they relate the story. And larger drawings, which you see on the on the top, are uh, I call diagrams. And uh, below you at you you see um, a diagram which was painted as a wall drawing uh, in Contemporary Art Center in Carlo in Ireland. And uh, at the time when the center started to include in their program uh, more community oriented content, so they wanted to have. Uh, a drawing or a mind map uh, that would uh, relate to issues that mattered to residents at the time. So this was uh, this the, the wall drawing, which was super huge and beautiful, was actually a statement of change for the institution. And uh, so we we see here. Uh, I went, of course, to to Carlo a couple of times. And we also made a workshop together about resilient Carlo. And you see the guy is holding a mind map. Again, this some kind of a diagram that residents make when they want to envision the future uh, of their community of the city. Uh, I think this imaginary of the future is very important in such projects. Uh, and below you see a photo of the first workshop on location in the Soweto project, a project I made with my students and local community in Orlando East neighborhood in Soweto. Uh, we worked on the project in 2014. And uh, of course, as in Carlo, residents of Soweto attempted to articulate a more resilient future with the project. Uh, well, this is actually the, the last slide in this uh, part of my talk. It's uh, just to, to tell you that design for the living world was a class of participatory practice, which I led at HFDK Hamburg from 2011 to 2018. Uh, what was maybe interesting is that when I was invited to teach, uh, they asked me explicitly not to uh, to focus on product design because I was uh, my class was located in the design department, so not to to focus on the object, but instead uh, the the program should be focused on challenges of the 21st century. Uh, personally, I'm interested in collaboration and participation, and uh, focus of design for the living world uh, class. Uh, was on participatory practices. Together with students, we worked on projects which we understood and took for school rooms to test the methods of self-organization and solidarity. Focus of the program was on people and not on objects or spatial design. So basically we, we worked with people that was the main focus. 
so now uh, I'm actually, this was an introduction, now I'm starting my talk about collaborative practices. I will, uh, I have five chapters for you and each of them is illustrated with a beautiful drawing by Helio Melo, uh, a painter and a rubber tapper, a rubber collector uh, who lived in the state of Acre in Amazonia and uh, whose work I encountered when I was uh, involved in Sao Paulo Biennial and I was, uh, I stayed in the state of Acre at some time uh, to realize a project. So uh, the chapter number one is titled A Pathway Forward in the Anthropocene Age. We see a rubber tapper uh, at the start of his journey. He envisions his work and roads he will travel that day. Uh, the drawing is a nice metaphor in my view for our, our, our own position in the Anthropocene Age. We too are at the beginning of our journey and we envision how to reach resilient existence. So we have questions like what are our challenges? What are the challenges we face? What will be our role in the process? So uh, let's look at the challenges now posed by climate change. Uh, and I apologize if you have seen this uh, graph 10,000 times before because actually it was uh, composed in uh, here in Stockholm in 2010. It's called uh, the Great Acceler Acceleration Diagram and it shows relationship between human activities and uh, how the planet reacts on them. Uh, on the left side you see in red color human actions and on the right in green color how the planet uh, reacts on those actions. Uh, the beauty of the diagram is that it visualizes a rise of human activities since beginning of industrial revolution, which means 1750 to 2010. Uh, if you see, the, there is a vertical line that goes through all the images, uh, and at this line marks the year 1950, which is uh, the year which we can name uh, start of uh, consumerist or the beginning or the rise of consumerist society. And this is where the curve goes dramatically up and which is so nicely illustrated on the image on the right side. Uh, so today on the pathway towards resilient society, we realize that we need to change this above paradigm with uh, uh, with, with, uh, with the statement, like we are looking here at the statement of uh, two activists, Greta Thunberg and George Montbio. And uh, I took the image, it's an ad for video published by The Guardian. And they ask us to protect, restore and fund uh, in a public space. So that's important that uh, I will not talk about this so much. Uh, I will talk about different focus, but they, they ask us to act in public space in order to reimagine our relationship with the planet. So uh, chapter number two, uh, I'll talk about three collaborative projects with us. And uh, um, do, when we look at the drawing of Helio Milo, what do we see? Uh, it's about working together, of course. Uh, Jonas told me that you come from various disciplines and backgrounds, and uh, here is a challenge when you work together. We know how to do things, but how do we do things together? That's the question. So instead of activists who call to action, like protect, restore, fund, uh, which actually marks awakening from neoliberal uh, social and economic agreement, I will point here in the following slides to more personal, more humble, but equally important assets of collaboration, which becomes visible in a participatory practice. I will talk about coexistence, codependence, and mutual respect and ability to trust each other. So trust, codependence, and so on. Uh, and these, uh, these elements, they address uh, personal space, uh, which actually afterwards become also a tool 
uh, in, in public space. Uh, please also, uh, I know it's a little bit of theory, but I just have to say something about uh, participation because participatory practices are really uh, important for collaborative practices. Uh, participation uh, was uh, gradually dismantled. It was very much alive after the Second World War, but it was gradually dismantled uh, uh, from like, uh, during 40 years of what I called neoliberal cloud, which is neoliberal social and economic agreement. And I put, uh, this is like my invention, these 40 years is from 1968, because it's a year of social revolution to 2008, which is the year of collapse of the banks. Um, so the, the thing is that now when we are out of this, uh, let's say, neoliberal cloud, we need participation again. Uh, because why? Because the challenges we face in a very, like, uh, like really quick, quick definition is withdrawal of social state and, of course, rise of climate change. And governments cannot do it alone, but they can do it together with residents. So we are, again, looking at this paradigm, how do we work together? How do residents and uh, governments work together? Uh, governments today, to, do, to make things together, they need more empowered and more engaged citizens who were uh, depoliticized during the time of consumerist era. Uh, so let's uh, go on. Um, uh, I'm not sure, but with yours, uh, with Yas and uh, Jonas, we talked that maybe we talk uh, more specifically about the projects, uh, the collaborative project with us later on. Uh, so I, I, I'm not, uh, I will not relate so much uh, the details or technical details of the project, but I will each of the project will relate on some element here. For instance, the cook, the farmer relates to the idea of trust or regaining trust in collaborative decision making uh, between the waters relates to the power of experience and of soil and water relates to value or uh, the need to reevaluate and not to take the existing value for granted. Uh, the cook, the farmer, um, this, uh, like, uh, my narrative here will focus on trust. Uh, the cook, the farmer was commissioned in 2009 uh, by the Stedelijk Museum, who at the time, the, uh, the museum at the time was being renovated and they thought they needed more visibility in the city, uh, the location. Uh, was uh, New Amsterdam, a modernist uh, garden city in decline uh, with uh, a lot of immigrants that were not well integrated and residents were passive and disillusioned. There were no one on the street. So I, we thought it was a really uh, a difficult situation. I was invited by, uh, by the Stedelijk Museum because I'm known for collaborative uh, projects and I thought they thought I could do something there. Of course, immediately I uh, formed a broad uh, group of collaborators and uh, started to work together with residents on the project. And of course, this was also the time when I started to work with Uz. Uh, the project ended up to be community garden and community kitchen. Uh, the project was located here. Um, it's the location you're looking at a uh, fence uh, in garden. It's called Keg Green. Uh, sorry, my pronunciation. And uh, it, uh, it's translated as looking only garden, meaning that the residents who are uh, like uh, who are bordering this garden, uh, they have to pay for maintenance of the garden, but they are not allowed to enter it. And the pressing issue for us uh, who, are, who started to collaborate with residents was decline of public space. And uh, just let me tell you a little timeline how it went. Uh, the Garden City was built after the Second World War and there was a lot of money put in the 
construction of the buildings, but there was no money left for the design of spaces, which in the 1970s was a very good, uh, um, like, it was a good, uh, it was really good in the 1970s because open spaces meant open society and democracy. In the 80s, the same open spaces became no man's land, they became dangerous and uh, started to be fenced in. In 2004, a public space was given to uh, developers who saw no value in green spaces. So we said we have to, as some kind of acupuncture uh, like uh, experience, uh, start to work on the site. Uh, this was the garden before, and uh, this was the garden after here. Uh, we worked with 30 families with seven ethnic groups. And what you are looking at is actually an act of placemaking uh, when the residents literally, uh, literally are taking roots in the neighborhood. Another a nice rendering of the project. So you can see the relationship between the garden and the kitchen. Uh, the kitchen was facing the street and it was uh, actually uh, uh, like, uh, it was just like behind, it was uh, like located behind uh, the, the entrance of to the community garden. Um, so uh, I'm talking now uh, about the imaginary of the project. What was the imaginary of the project uh, for us who started to work with, with residents? We wanted to reinvent public space by creating a shared space. Uh, so uh, like each of these projects, I will talk about what were the pressing issues and what is imaginary. So the pressing issue here was the decline of public space and our imaginary was to create a shared space. Now, when we're talking about shared space uh, and we're talking about cooking, uh, growing vegetables, sharing food, uh, we have to understand it's not really about producing a lot of food. Uh, this is a community garden is a symbolic uh, the activities in such a garden are symbolic activities, but there are also uh, these kinds of spaces are political school rooms, which I think are very important always to understand. So when we uh, presented the project uh, we, to local uh, administrators with whom we also worked, apart from the curator from the Skede League, uh, they, they said, well, this doesn't, this will not work, you will fail, this is how things are not done here, and so on. So, uh, of course, we insisted, and here is the first uh, formula for you, uh, you have to trust yourself and your imaginary. And actually, it's very important to try new formats that don't seem to work to invent new ways of doing things. Um, so here I say, I trust the community. Uh, we uh, created a, a semi-public space uh, with sharing kitchen, a uh, new kind of meeting space in the neighborhood. And outcome was actually a reduction of violence in the neighborhood, but also uh, it lowered, uh, the project lowered the perception of violence inside the neighborhood, but also uh, in perspective, from the perspective view of the people who lived in the city center. Uh, trust your collaborators. Uh, you have to trust your, uh, like collaborators are talking about residents who eventually start to develop the project uh, according to what they think it should be, uh, but also you have to trust your own group uh, because some are some we have all different personalities and interests. So some are more on involved on site, and some people engage. Uh, of course, people engage in different ways. So trust uh, your collaborators, and also uh, trust what you see or what you make. Uh, and name it also, it was very important to say, this is a community space, this is a community garden. It's a new form of public space. Uh, so also we, we were, uh, when, we, when I say you have to 
name what you see, it's also to define the difference with what has been there, with the practices that have been there before, uh, such as allotments. We know allotments were uh, important in the, let's say, 20th century. They're still around. But uh, the idea of the allotment is actually one, one garden for one family. And they are usually dislocated as a family outside of your community in a, let's say, unfunctional space. Community gardens are completely different. Here, one garden belongs to more families and they are not located smack in the middle of the, of the neighborhood. The best is actually if you can control your garden from the window, uh, of, from, the, from your window. Um, there is also something which uh, comes to mind here. Uh, community gardens are organized by residents themselves. They are not organized by the city. And uh, I used to live in Berlin, so I know that in Berlin you have more than 100 community gardens. And uh, it's actually important that the city recognizes them, but also that uh, also communities who work on them recognize them as a value, that they put a value on, on them as something which is beneficial not only to their families, communities, but also to the city. A harvesting day, uh, a little bit uh, um, an image, sort of a, like an Eden image, if I may say. Um, harvesting day was a celebration of the project, but also a ritual of transition because we uh, co-organizers of the project withdrew and uh, residents formed a committee and self-organized the project. Uh, but they also, you see here on the right side the photo, people discussing issues in the greenhouse. They also share the knowledge. They uh, tell, told others how to make a community garden in this way. So in a way, what I'm telling you here again is you have to trust the project that it develops according to what it wants, actually. Um, but that is, uh, this is the last trust. A note here, you have to trust the participatory practice uh, because uh, the first project, the Cook the Farmer, stopped working after two years, but it was renewed uh, in 2018 as a social garden uplift, this is the official name, uh, by Cascoland, an uh, Amsterdam-based network of artists and designers who with students worked with a community again and they formed 13 gardens uh, and the project is still running. So trust the practice. Uh, it can reinvent itself because it does not depend on authorship. So this is the power of co-authorship. It stays, the memory stays and it, it, uh, people are able to reuse or to reinvent it again. Uh, we are at the second project with us and I'll focus on the power of experience. Uh, so in 2010, uh, we were commissioned by uh, Emscher Genossenschaft to make a public art project, uh, which lasted in 2010 uh, three months. And then because it was bought by the Emscher Kunst, uh, they reinstalled it again in 2013. Uh, what you see is actually uh, an infrastructure line uh, that, that performed cleaning of dirty water let's put it, and made it clean water, in short. Uh, you, visitors uh, of, of this project were able to come up and use the two toilets here on the right side, the, the yellow uh, little buildings. And the project also spanned, I have to explain the geography here, the project spanned between two rivers. On the left, you see Rheinherde Canal. And on the right side, you see Emscher River, which was at the time the most polluted river in Germany. In fact, they said if you would fall in, you would die. So we were not allowed to, to touch the dike. And this is why actually we came, we ended up having this dramatic cantilever uh, with the two, two toilets, which was not planned at first. So this is also uh, a nice, you know, like development of the project when you have to change something. Uh, 
the pressing issue here was uh, polluted river. And uh, here another nice photo from above. And uh, I wanted to, with this actually photo shows that the two rivers were above the, the city because the city sank due to the collect uh, due to the mining activities. So actually the, the two rivers were, were flowing above the city. Uh, so it was very special, uh, very special case, so to speak. So when you zoom in, you see this little infrastructure line. It was a water and supply treatment installation. And uh, of course, uh, we worked uh, with natural cleaning of water. Uh, we worked on this project with only with water on the side, with Emscher River, Rheinhertel Canal, rainwater, and of course, human wastewater. Uh, we are looking here at uh, constructed wetlands, uh, like uh, the, four, the four red containers. Uh, they are home for hellified filter plants that clean the water. The more you use toilets, the more plants grow. Uh, the imaginary of the project was uh, to show power of nature and basically plants to clean water. So we, we were cleaning Imsha River also but, and the human wastewater. Uh, also, we wanted to show power of nature to regenerate itself, but also we wanted to show human existence in a water cycle. Uh, if, you are, if you use the project, you could say, uh, I am a water cycle. I think this was like uh, uh, this imagination which we had and it actually worked very well. Because as I said before, because of power of experience. So visitors walked the installation on the top above Emshire River, uh, there were two toilets and on the other side of the, of the installation, on a small pier above Rheinherne Canal was a drinking water fountain. So the experience of using the toilet and afterwards drink water from the site changed everything. This was this, uh, the project was actually successful as it gave visitors a personal experience, a body experience, and the recognition that we are part of nature. So usually if you, you know, like uh, as the, in spaces you, you live, you just open tap water and the water comes out. But here, all this process was exposed to, so but people not only saw it, but they could, could also use it. Uh, we created here a nature theater, the stage of the Anthropocene. You as visitor found yourself on the stage and became part of the process and part of the discussion. So uh, another nature theater and another stage of the Anthropocene. Uh, this is the Osoil and Water King's Cross Pond Club which was uh, like on uh, working on site two years. It was temporary public art project uh, commissioned by the developers of King's Cross uh, neighborhood. Uh, this was first man-made natural swimming pool in United Kingdom for some reason. Um, it was open to swimming all year around summer and winter. Uh, with this project, I will focus on value and the need to re-evaluate and not to take value uh, that exists for granted. Location, we started this, is, this kind of projects like with the Future Island here in Stockholm are very long term. Uh, so the project uh, was there uh, 2015 and 16, but we started to work on it already in 2013. Uh, location was the center of London. Uh, below, you see uh, King's Cross railway station. And uh, of course, uh, there was this uh, big uh, uh, real estate development in progress, which at the time I thought it was the biggest real estate development in Europe. Inspirations for the projects were uh, Regent's Canal uh, that ran through the location, uh, beautiful 
uh, water channel and can be streamed, uh, no, can I, yeah, it's Canada, it's Canada, it's, it can be streamed natural reserve. And of course, uh, the massive construction site was also uh, inspiration. The pressing issue here was to imagine other relationships but private and public ownership of land. So we wanted to imagine the city as an ecosystem. So how to get out of these private public uh, relationships that we uh, have when we think about uh, land in the cities. So on this very contested site, we decided to reframe the question. We said, value of the land is not real estate. Value of the land is soil and water, two natural resources we live with every day. We depend on them, but we take for granted. So we added a, a new key value for us was uh, codependence or dependence on nature as a value. So codependence on soil and water is a value. Uh, the imaginary of the project, that's, uh, that's the image uh, which illustrated the proposal. Uh, you see here a person swimming in a natural pond in the middle of construction site in the center of London. Uh, and so the image implies, uh, actually, here is a performance of human relationship with nature. It shows power of nature to regenerate itself as water here is purified solely by plants. Uh, the project was invitation to think city uh, as an ecosystem by creating an ecosystem. Uh, a, few to, a few photos, what it became. Uh, swimmers, swimmers enjoy a soft uh, living water uh, in comparison with what we call dead water, meaning water cleaned with chlorine. Uh, here, a permaculture garden in full bloom uh, another large landscape, uh, you are looking at Hellofy filter plants in action, cleaning water. Here you see diagrams of water cleaning systems and uh, check uh, the third uh, icon, which says 163. It, uh, it actually means 163 persons per day because 163 uh, people is the maximum number of swimmers uh, that allows plants to clean water. And uh, I'm talking, of course, uh, about balance between people and nature, and of course, codependent, codependency to them. Um, logo of the project, we put uh, the word club in the title, and we discuss it a lot because it has this weird connotation. Um, so club is commonly understood as space of privilege. And here, yes, it's a privileged space, but it means an agreement with nature. Uh, the pond became obviously very popular. Uh, London's uh, wild swimming community loved it. When we started the project, we were not aware that uh, wild swimming was very popular in London. Uh, wild swimming means that you, you, uh, you swim in nature throughout the year. Users uh, thought of it as an unusual experimental place. Uh, people came for different reasons. They came from uh, the neighborhood. For instance, railway, railway workers for a pre-work swim. And from as far as New York uh, to celebrate an anniversary with friends. In autumn 2016, biodiversity was clearly visible. Uh, users recognized biodiversity the project had created. It was somehow celebrated the project. Uh, basically, what for us designers were, was very rewarding because we started the project without any community is the fact that the, commun that the community was formed around uh, issues that the project created. Uh, basically, users embraced our initial concept, which was that, uh, that, that we have to value soil and water, two natural reserves natural resources above real estate, and we have to value dependence on nature. When it was announced that the pond was closing very quickly, very quickly community formed to prevent closure of the pond. 
and in a creative way, uh, they organized splash mob. So on a cold October morning, they walked from King's Cross railway station to the pond when the air temperature was 12 degrees Celsius and water temperature 10 degrees Celsius and marked a closure of the pond with the final swim. Thus, they performed a ritual of transition from wild swim lovers to politically engaged community. The petition. Uh, the petition saved King, King, uh, King's Cross Pond. Uh, the, the group, uh, the main group that formed around uh, the, the project collected uh, basically without us being involved in any way. 5,300 signatures. And uh, what I thought was very interesting, what the, their demands were very interesting. So they demanded that temporary project uh, turns into permanent project. When this did not work, then demanded that pond be replaced someplace else in London. When this did not work, uh, they demanded that biodiversity be replaced. This eventually, I believe, happened. Uh, and they, they actually uh, claimed, uh, they realized that the project became integral part of the green belt of London. So it was not possible just to, to get rid of it. Uh, so important for me again was that the group uh, knew exactly how they would do it, but they would need more time. Uh, they would need a year to reorganize space and get the project going. Uh, my point here is uh, very important for me. They envisioned the space as community organized and maintained public space, a new form of public space, which I'm actually narrating through this talk all the time. And when all of this were, uh, was happening, uh, I, I have an afterthought. They, I said, uh, okay, they did not demand to change the legal status of the land, but they could, yes? When all of this was happening, uh, of course, you think about it naturally because uh, the location is uh, in the UK. Uh, could this space become a collectively, collectively owned land in the country that excelled in enclosures, a meaning acceler accelerated decline of common land? Here do we witness a seemingly unexpected rise of the commons? Or is it community organized and maintained public space, a new phenomena in the spirit of Thomas Piketty's uh, social property or temporary ownership? Uh, we learned that uh, the community or publicness is created around an issue. Here, the city is an ecosystem. And as in the Cook the Farmer project, uh, you understand that people take the project forward themselves. And here also just a little note about the ownership. The owner is only not the owner of the, the land, but also understands themselves as, as stewards of, of, the, of the land. So we are here in the third chapter, which is about tools. And we are again looking at uh, Helio Miller's drawing showing a rubber tapper with a list of his tools. Uh, but when uh, we think about our position and wanting, let's say what I always say, wanting to attain the resilient city, we ask uh, what is our role in this? What are our tools in the process? And uh, here is a diagram that shows uh, how new tools relate to new roles. Uh, in, in this process. A diagram, I made this diagram to explain to my students, uh, to explain the relationship between culture and art. Because when you ask uh, what is more important, culture or art, the main question is always culture, because art depends on culture and art as a relational object is also a tool to change culture. And I would like you to remind, like, to remind you that you can uh, you can change the word art here with design or architecture. I'm just using art because 
if I had to put a word there. So relational object is object that creates relationship. It is not a self-referential object. Uh, so in this paradigm, our roles change. So you are not author anymore, you are co-author and you are a mediator. So a relational object becomes a tool that you can use, you as a person, but also a community. So uh, like uh, I understand uh, a relational object can also be community-based project, which as I said before, a tool community uses to build, let's say, new agreements in society. But the relational objects are also methods. They are tools we artists, designers use when working on projects. So in Soviet project that I will relate now on, I will talk about uh, how we articulate about uh, the methods we articulated in the Soviet project, which were uh, ritual of transition, performative actions, marking of territory, naming, and so on. But first of all, I have to uh, show you two uh, slides that are uh, explaining the, uh, the project itself. Uh, the Soviet project uh, was uh, happened in 2014. Uh, I worked there with my students uh, from Design for the Living class of participatory practice at Haldeka Hamburg. We were invited to Soweto uh, as part of nine urban biotops, a cover name for nine public art projects that happened in, uh, I think, four locations, five locations in South Africa and four locations in Europe. Uh, so uh, the beauty of nine urban biotops project was uh, their philosophy to work on uh, these kinds of research projects long term. Uh, with my students, I lived and worked in Soviet two and a half months. And also the focus of the project was exchange of knowledge between people of two different cultures. A pressing issue here was uh, the fact that public space where we worked was a dumping ground uh, for already 40 years, which was a legacy of apartheid. I'll talk about it later. Uh, but this, uh, what was here uh, for us unimaginable was that it was a public land. Uh, this public land was in fact a no man's land. And so were actually no regulations uh, applied at all. So uh, uh, the methods uh, here now, I walk you through a few slides that show a method, that we, a few methods we used in the project. Uh, together with uh, local community, we transformed public space located in the middle of residential neighborhood into community organized in the same public space. Uh, sorry, I, this I already said before, I think. Uh, but uh, what was here very important was this fact that we got together with residents and we cleaned it on a Saturday morning. Uh, it just took four hours. Uh, of work, working together to clean the space which was uh, dumping ground for 40 years. So this uh, method is called ritual of transition and it's very important. Uh, we, I use it in all projects that I'm uh, a part of. Ritual of transition, it's something uh, which is important. Yeah. Then performative action, a uh, Soviet street festival um, which was co-organized with residents. And you are looking at the parade, uh, which is celebration of the neighborhood. Uh, and here residents see themselves uh, sort of in a Freudian mirror as a successful community, as a happy, positive community. Uh, but they are not only performers or actors uh, in, in the street, they are also, they, they understand they are also actors in the city politics and manage, management of, of their city. So there is this transition between what an actor and performer is. Uh, the platform is a relational object. Uh, the platform for arts and culture, uh, which was uh, became a symbol of the, this new space. 
uh, it was built with uh, like it was we made a beton platform with uh, with wooden poles because if we would work with iron it would get stolen in a no man's land and uh, here place making um, this, we are looking at making foundations for the platform and place making the way how sociologists uh, define define place making is that any community that wants to be recognized needs a physical space so physical space matters as we know from the experience of agora and all major uh, gatherings we have in public space act of naming another methodology uh, this the, the the space where we worked was uh, no man's land but it also had no name so we are looking at here at inauguration of this new public space the community organized public space and uh, we see paulina who was a part of the ubuntu park committee she came up on the stage and she gave the name to the project the name was chosen by the community and we had no clue she would name it she said this is ubuntu park and then she said before it was hell and now it's paradise so i said oh my god what is she talking about it's super biblical so when she talked about hell she referred to the status quo to paralysis in action of the community and when she, talk, when she talked about paradise she talked about uh, that community was able to to take ownership of the space and that the community got engaged around the project. Uh, the name uh, always has a meaning as well. It's important how we name things. Uh, so Ubuntu, here someone scribbled during uh, dinner uh, to explain what Ubuntu means. People is the people because of other people. But I, I can also uh, here uh, make another definition which is actually uh, the traditional uh, the ubuntu is actually traditional african philosophy uh, that talks about enlarged uh, subjectivity that i talked about before and the formula is i am because we are uh, so I, actually i always think when i look at this equation i am because we are i always think about this european uh, formula which we still uh, relate to when we talked about the card I think therefore I am so it's very important to to understand that different cultures have different value systems or different meanings how they explain uh, themselves basically so I, I showed uh, methods a few methods composed by uh, design for the living world class uh, and this became uh, this method, the list of methods became contribution to new vocabulary. Uh, and we would, you would do if you would uh, be embarked on a project, you would uh, come up with different methods, because each project, each case, each, each case study, also has each group of co-workers creates different knowledge. So, so different case studies, different people who work on, on projects, they create new knowledge. And uh, what is important here is to say that we don't need objective knowledge or standardized knowledge anymore. Of course, we live with, with it. And we will live with modernism uh, for years and maybe centuries to come. But we have to understand its relative position in our culture today. Uh, we, we, we have to make visible with, we, with renewed knowledge production. We have to make visible what was seemingly invisible before. So that's so important. It's very important uh, for you to create new vocabularies in your practice. Uh, so we are now uh, in chapter number four, and uh, it's titled Exchange of Knowledge. And here we are looking at a super strange hybrid. It's a half cow and half tree. Uh, it's a story from Amazonia where trees are replaced with cattle. Uh, so when the trees are gone, will Helio Melo be able to still collect rubber or not? Is it him or it's 
big agriculture business who will survive, so to speak. So for Helio Milo, this is an existential question. And, and for us, uh, the existential question is construction of hybrid knowledge. So we need the, the hybrid knowledge. Uh, we have to construct new kind, new kind of uh, knowledge. Uh, and uh, this, uh, the, the knowledge is constructed between different disciplines, but also between different cultures, between different culture spaces. I think I talked about this before. Uh, so by working together, we can construct new vocabulary. You can't do it alone. You need this kind of opposing ideas to be able to, to come to a new knowledge or actually to let go of uh, the old uh, preconceptions that you have. And the question here is, uh, how do we get away from, uh, let's say, modernist paradigm or, or standardized knowledge? Uh, how do we get away from the universal recipes that we have learned? Uh, in short, how do we get uh, from uh, away from all of these discourse? And uh, another diagram here shows uh, the, the difference between linear and subjective thinking and making. Uh, so a straight, straight line, uh, black line shows linear thinking, which is objective. So planning ahead, uh, it's planning ahead and focus on efficiency. And uh, the red line, the circling red line, the curve means subjective thinking. So rerouting in subjective thinking takes more time. And uh, of course, reminder here that, uh, that uh, modernism and also in the couple with neoliberal practices uh, they, of course, go for, uh, for linear thinker thinking because it's most effective. Uh, but here, uh, I want to translate this diagram into practice. So this is the same diagram, but we are looking here at how we understood it in practice. So construction workers in Soviet-O excelled in subjective thinking. Here we see them considering a wall when we knew there would be none ever. So the exercise took them one day and we said, we got very nervous, we said, we are running out of time. So we didn't consider ourselves linear thinkers, but of course we were in this case. We realized later that by pushing subject, sub, subjective thinking away, we were also losing the power of intuition because as intuition, as you know, is a precondition for any creativity. So basically, when you're pushing away uh, things, you, you lose, you, you think you gain something, but you also lose something. Uh, so here is the final chapter. Uh, it's uh, challenges and threats and successes. Uh, here we see farmers working on the land and struggling against big agribusiness uh, that is here disguised as a horse on a rocking chair. So this was situation in the 80s in the state of Agria. Uh, so workers on the land faced a lot of challenges. Uh, some, some of the challenges became traps and uh, some, sometimes they were also success stories. Uh, I will show you a few challenges uh, we encountered in Soweto. Uh, first, uh, two preconceptions related to security. So the question here is, what brings safety to a place? Is it fence or people? In modernist tradition, uh, people are the best protection. And uh, because, uh, because open space means open society and democracy, as we saw before. But this is not... Uh, how residents saw it. So this was the position by uh, my students and myself, but the residents, they demanded three meter high barbed fences to exclude others and protect themselves. And uh, we, at the end, we came to a symbolic uh, marking of territory. Uh, we came to a solution that the, the space uh, demands uh, a fence, but it should be just a symbolic fence, half a meter tall, 
that you can actually step over, but it, it marks the territory. So marking the territory, territory is also one of the words in the, in the new vocabulary. Another nice story, uh, safety, is it safe to eat your lunch in a public space? Actually, it's not because people would come and eat your lunch. Uh, so it's a story related to uh, barbecue stands, uh, which you see on the left side. Uh, with residents, we agreed to, they actually demanded uh, barbecue stands in the, this open space because they saw them in, uh, in parks, in public parks in Johannesburg. And to them, it was somehow a representation of public space. But when we constructed them, no one used them. Uh, so we, we figured out that the local community had no clue about what semi-public spaces are. And also a uh, little note that uh, like they, they actually didn't understand that uh, the way how we understand that when a family cooks dinner at a barbecue stand in a public space, it means they're the ones to eat it. So an outsider can join, can join by invitation, but not automatically. So they, they were not, they didn't understand the private oasis in a public chaos that could be uh, like made with these barbecue uh, stands, cooking on barbecue stands. So lessons we learned uh, is that we Westerners think that everyone understands public space the way we do. We just like, we just take it for granted. Uh, but public space is not a given. Uh, it's a social construction. It's a social agreement. And, uh, I'll talk more about it. But uh, first, uh, an, uh, an unexpected success story. Uh, success of the project uh, was not design of space or objects. It was uh, because projects started to heal trauma associated with public space in Soweto. We only understood at the, at the end of the project that, that, that there was this uh, really embrace, that the community embraced the project, but we didn't understand why, what was the reason. So uh, it was because it started to heal trauma of the public space. And I tried to understand to relate to you uh, what happened during apartheid. Uh, this was already 40 years ago. And this was actually 20 years when we joined the project, it was 20 years after the black African community was in political power by ANC party. Uh, so uh, during apartheid, uh, the black community was excluded from public space. They were not allowed to sit on a bench. Uh, the bench serves Europeans only, and it's now standing in front of Apartheid Museum, but they were not also allowed to vote, so they were exclude, excluded from public sphere. And the loss has been internalized, and disregard for public space crashing continues and continues uh, until today. Uh, actually, I just took, uh, it's a photo from a local newspaper when we were there, so this kind of trash public spaces was everywhere. So what is a public space? Uh, but uh, now, uh, just a few words about uh, the process of participation, of participatory design, and the rules of engagement, uh, which, which opens for us doors uh, to articulate what is relational object, what are tools, and what are methods. So uh, here we, we said very simply, we have four steps of participatory design. It's nothing new, we didn't invent it. I think it's a knowledge from already articulated in the 60s. Uh, for me, the fourth step is most important. It says transferring the responsibility for the project to the community in order to leave behind a sustainable work that benefits the community in the long run. So we, su we succeeded and uh, to transfer the responsibility to the community. And this is how uh, my students explained uh, the success to other students back in Hamburg. They said, success means we became irrelevant. Uh, exactly when 
local community took the project over. So actually, you are able to step uh, away and the project uh, develops on its own. Uh, you are looking here at the uh, Ubuntu Park community members uh, that self-organized in five groups. Uh, one was group of security, the other maintenance, uh, urban agriculture, art and culture, and children's playground. Uh, this all, of course, uh, was organized to become a community organized and maintained public space. I add to these public spaces a social agreement, and you can also say without social agreement, there is no public space. Uh, the process of the project showed that social architecture is more important than design of objects or spatial designs for the art for art. Uh, so I'm, I'm just like uh, somehow closing, but I have uh, maybe an interesting uh, thought to share. Uh, last year, I traveled in Australia, and a friend alerted me to the book uh, Decolonizing Methodologies, written by Linda Tukiwai Smith. Uh, she's a professor of Maori Indigenous Studies in New Zealand. Uh, so I, I read the book, I was super surprised to read a list of nearly identical methods, which we in Soweto uh, project developed to overcome uh, modernist discourse, Stalinization, objective knowledge, and so on. And now this is interesting, uh, that Maori Aboriginal communities use the methods, very similar methods, uh, to shield themselves, to shield themselves against neoliberalist, neoliberal pra practices and consequences of colonization. Colonization. And so I realized that Maori and my students found ourselves together in the process of decolonization and demodernization. So actually, these are a few things that we have to work on in the future. Uh, there is also uh, maybe just a little. Um, two diagrams, if you are not aware, uh, there is a super interesting, very insightful article written in the 60s uh, called Ladder of Participation. Uh, it's available online, where actually uh, it depicts with uh, Sherry Arnstein, uh, the author who, do, who actually tells very e in simple way what is real participation and fake participation. On the left side, we see also a diagram, which I redrew, but it's a wisdom from the 60s. It's a power relationship between people and government. And uh, the idea is actually to overturn the pyramid. So actually, that the, the, the knowledge of the people trickles down to politicians, not so that the pyramid is not like this, but it goes down. So the knowledge of the people trickles down. And here in the middle, you see researchers. It's written researchers. It's actually, it's you and uh, young professionals or researchers or uh, whenever you will be included in or a part of this kind of project, it's very important. Your role is very important. Uh, so maybe I uh, stop, uh, stop now and uh, we can escape. Voila, I escaped.